It's all good. All right, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and get the show on the road with this. Um, we had a really good uh, turnout. I think we had like ninety five people register, but we were kind of scratching our heads because it didn't specify whether you were online or in person. So it's kind of like we'll put out enough chairs. Um, but hope hopefully we'll have a little more clarity on details of the plant sale. Um, I'll go ahead and kick this off. Obviously, the plant sale is it's a big event for us. It's a lot of a lot of energy and effort goes into it from growing the plants, picking the plants, getting everything set up. And every year we try to get better at doing it, getting more efficient. Um, one nice thing that we're we're looking forward to apparently. Um, uh, financial services, which provides us with the credit card transaction thing. Apparently it's a better system now. So it's not, you know, the uh, ordeal that it has been in the past. So we're, we're actually looking forward to trying that out, but um, just quickly running through some details right at the beginning. Um, and we'll cover this again at the end. Um, as always, this, uh, one of the benefits of being a friend of the gardens is you get early access to all these really cool plants. Um, and oftentimes we do sell out with a, probably, I would say at least 20% of the plants we have in the plant sale will sell out during the pre-sale period. Um, and we do our best to track inventory. Um, I'm still looking for a system that we could actually just plug the numbers in and it would do it for itself. But um, until that day arrives, it's a lot of uh, double checking. Um, but as your orders come in, you can do that up until about 8 p.m. on the Wednesday before the sale, because at some point we, we just got to, you know, end taking orders because we've got to move on to getting everything pulled and getting set up. Um, we do ask that pre-orders get paid bef before they get picked up. It just makes it makes things a lot simpler for dealing with multiple transactions and everything. Um, after this talk, uh, Sarah and her team will email. They've compiled all the current members, all the emails um, up to, you know, the most current information that we have. If you do not, and that should happen shortly after the talk concludes, kind of right between two and three. Um, if you don't get an email showing up first, uh, check your spam folder. Um, it's amazing how many things will show up there that shouldn't be in there. Um, check that, but then you can also reach out to us as well. But once we get the pre-orders in, um, you know, bear with us. I try to, this is one of those situations where we can't have too many cooks in the kitchen. So I process every order. Um, you know, we go through, try to make sure we have everything that you've ordered. We send back a confirmation with a total. Um, it'll have a link in there. And we're setting up all the pickups uh, ideally on Friday. Um, that's one of the things we've learned is during the big plant sale on Saturday, having to manage pickups and the plant sale can kind of get a little cumbersome. So we're just trying to make things, we try to make things as smooth as possible. Um, and, you know, we're always open to suggestion. We can, we know we can always do things better. Um, but one of the things again on Friday, you know, you can pre-order and then wander and hopefully more things catch your fancy. So, uh, you know, as I tell people with plants, you know, hey, it could be drugs, you know. Um, and one thing we have made a change over the last couple of years is we actually are including tax was previously we would have to take that out of everything that we have brought in. So, um, you know, no offense, but we're not going to foot a uh, tax bill. Um, but it all, you know, and this the, one of the things to always remember this, this helps support the gardens. Um, Again, if you are on the call on uh, on Zoom or in the audience, if you are not a member, um, it's very easy to go online. You just go to renolda.org, go to support, go to memberships, and it's pretty much as, uh, an easy process to go through. Um, and we're going to have to cut it off at Sunday because you know things that come in online, it takes that long for it to transition to actually get to us to to know that you know, hey, you're a member. Um, but hopefully all of you already are members. Um, and again, you know, we can't stress this enough. The sale is on the front lawn at Renolda House. There's just simply no way we could, especially right now with all the construction going on, that we could squeeze it in in front of the greenhouse. Um, and the sale will run on Saturday from 8 to 2 p.m. Um, again, this was that stuff about the link will go out shortly after this talk. Um, I'm pretty sure the subject line will be that pre-order your favorites from the spring plant sale. Um, but just search, you know, plant sale or something like that if you're not seeing it immediately. Um, 
with all those details being run through that now we get to the fun part this is uh i shared this image before this was at a uh, conference we went i spoke at in the fall up in Asheville, and this was the sign at the hotel and i was like yep we're with my people um so you know this is always exciting for us it's it's um, it's something that I take enjoyment because we can, you know, I get to see a lot of really cool plants, you know, with my connections and everything and sharing them with everyone else is, you know, I trained at the Ralston Arboretum and JC was, you know, the catalyst for sharing plants. And that's, you know, something that, you know, is, is near and dear to me of you see great plants, get them to other people. Um, so with that being said, we'll jump in, we'll kind of go. Um, a little bit, you know, by uh, plant groups. If you do have questions, you know, raise your hand. Um, I'm happy to answer questions as we go. Um, but, you know, starting out, we've got a number of different coleus. Um, I, can't I can't promise you uh, uh, consonants throughout the en entire talk, but we do have a cornucopia of coleus, you know, it's a fun word to use. Um, but, you know, coleus, they are, they're fantastic annuals, they're easy to grow, and there's so many different colors and forms and textures that you can use. So we try to have a good smattering of different ones uh, to be able to offer. Um, a couple of these, Yellow Dragon and Morning After, were really fun ones. Shiny Shoes is a really unique one. It's almost jet black, but it's shiny. This was a seedling that showed up under a bench at Biltmore. Um, they just, someone noticed, Hey, you know, what's that? Let's hold on to it. And it is one of the most distinctive looking coleus that's out there. Um, the one below it is one that Hayden actually found a sport on one of the existing ones that we had. I think it was rustic orange or, um, orange King that had a really narrow yellow band. Well, he saw a sport that had a wider band. So, um, this is Hayden's, uh, contribution to all the coleus cultivars out there. Um, but again, you know, they're so easy to mix with other things. This is one of my favorites, fishnet stockings. This is an old cultivar. I mean, there's still, there's hundreds of coleus cultivars out there, but this one, like, this is what I love you can do is you can play off like that purple on the, in the veins on that coleus was a perfect mirror on that, uh, Pharaoh's mass colocasia. So, um, you know, again, we, we've got, I don't know if we've got somewhere between eight to 10 different coleus. So, you know, there's, there's a coleus out there for you. Um, yes. They're pretty much all, almost all the coleus we offer are gonna get about, you know, probably 24 to 30 inches tall. They're easy. If they start getting too tall, just hack them. Um, you know, they'll, they'll respond very easily. Again, even when like going into fall, when they start flowering, um, you can pinch those flowers off if, if you want to do that, but they're just so easy to take care of. Another question. All, almost all the coleus, it's funny because, you know, many moons ago, almost all coleus was shade. Now to try to try to find a shade coleus at this point. I mean, you can put these in shade. The colors are going to be a bit more muted um, and they won't be as dense, but they'll still grow in shade. Um, but almost all of these are pretty much sun coleus at this point. Um, Cupia, these are fun plants. And if you want hummingbirds in your garden, um, definitely David Verity, they will go bonkers over that plant. It's tiny, uh, you know, one of the common names is cigar flower, but anything you see those tubular flowers on something and you gotta be thinking hummingbirds or butterflies. Um, and David Verity will, will top out probably about 30 inches tall probably about 25 inches wide. It's, it's a nice size uh, tender. Um, uh, Lavella, which is the bat face kufia. Um, that's another one that's, that's you know, really cool. Um, again, tubular flowers, the hummingbirds love it. Um, and then this new one, pink shimmer. It's, I'm curious to see how this does. It's really kind of airy. The flowers are very small on it. So I can see a lot of a lot of little pollinators going to it, but not you know necessarily butterflies or hummingbirds on that one. Um, it would be a really funny looking hummingbird with a beak, you know, really tiny. Um, but it's yeah, what it it's kind of like what it makes what it lacks in size, it makes up for in number. So it's almost kind of a mist looking on the flowers. Um, 
this was an ornamental grass I saw years ago. Uh, a friend of ours up at University of Maryland grew this. And, you know, the look on it, it's a penicetum, and it almost looks like corn, the way that it grows with the leaves. Um, it really gets going once we start getting some heat. You know, a lot of our tender perennials, they'll kind of, you know, last year in June, when we had that cool June, everything just sat. And it was driving me crazy. But once we started getting some good temperatures, things started going. And this is one that definitely responds that way. Um, it'll easily top six feet in terms of height. Um, sometimes you might need to tie it up a little bit, but it just gives a great texture in the garden. Um, especially, you know, you get a little breeze and it starts blowing in the garden. I love movement. Um, and this will do that for you. Um, and it is a tender one. It's not some like some of the other perennial penicetums. This one is, is completely tender. Um, this was, you know, number one, you can see that coleus shiny shoes is that black on the left-hand side of that photo. Um, but what we're highlighting is this Plectranthus silver shield. And, you know, silver is just a, it's an easy color to use for a lot of different, you know, bouncing colors off of. We did kind of silver and, and uh, black in this bed. Um, but this will top out probably about 30 inches tall. It's a really good grower. Um, the flower, again, it'll, it's, it's a mint relative. It's got almost like, um, when you think about lamb's ear, those furry, fuzzy leaves. So it's one that, you know, A, being a mint, B, having fuzzy, you know, leaves. Deer really don't, that's a combination they really are going to, you know, they're going to have to be really, really hungry to go after something like that. Um, but this is a, just a great, foliage plant and it seems like a lot of when going through our list of what we've got a lot of what we have is more about foliage color than flowers and I mean let's face it that's going to last the whole season sometimes you'll have things that'll come into flower in summer but when you've got colorful foliage that's all season the taller one that that we did papayas last year um papaya it was, and that those, those were, it is, um, and actually, um, I will have to try to do this again next year, but those papayas that we grew, um, they were from seed and some of these papayas, you know, this is off the subject, but you'll start them from seed and they'll be, tr they'll be about 10 feet tall by the end of the season. Um, Well, our, our season's a little short on the papayas. Um, Forrest promised me that he can pickle green papayas. Uh, he, 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 le he, he let me down last summer. We didn't get any pickled papayas, but. Um, yeah, we started early in the greenhouse, but got those out. But again, those kind of sat there until we started getting some heat going. Um, but the Plectranthus is fantastic. This is another one that I really, the flowers are secondary. Um, this is a really cool, I can't find a bet, a good common name for Pseudoranthemum, except for false Aranthemum, which, you know, that's really not sexy. Um, but this is one I first saw. Uh, there's a nursery in Hawaii that does mail order. And we, I saw this on their list and I was like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a junkie. So I'm like, I gotta have it. Um, and this is one that's, kind of starting to pick up steam and I've seen it in a couple of different botanical gardens. Um, I think Janet Draper had it up at the Smithsonian and then Carl Gerson's up at Longwoods lusting after it. So I'm hoping we can kind of barter with him, but this gets this almost kind of bronzy older foliage and you've got that, that, I don't know how you describe it, a reddish purple um, new growth, but that contrast in the colors is fantastic, and it absolutely loves the heat down here. So this is a this is a really great foliage plant. Um, end of the season, you'll get kind of magenta-like flowers on it, but again, that's not why you're going to grow this plant. Um, I did see reference that some people used to grow this as an old house plant. Um, worth trying. It's easy something you can put in a container and just drag it inside for the winter. Um, but this is one that we've had some success with. Um, this is another one, you know, the old uh, salvia splendens that we do as a bedding plant. Well, the, the old species actually would get some size. And this is a really cool variegated leaf one called Dancing Flames. Um, again, you know, that red, flat, red tubular flowers, easy to, you know, hummingbirds are going to go after this. 
but this is one that the flowers really don't start coming in until later in the season, but you're going to have that bright yellow foliage that's really going to stand out. And again, there's that Pharaoh's mask, Colocasia, that um, I walked by and a leaf had kind of laid down in it. And I was like, oh, perfect, perfect little photo shoot there. Um, but this is, again, it's an easy salvia. Um, if you want to attract hummingbirds and some butterflies in your garden, the, the salvias really will do it. Um, if you're really looking for butterflies, um, I went through my, my porter weed phase a couple years ago where I wanted everyone out there. Um, and we've kind of kept a good stock on a couple different ones. Though what these are, they're related to verbenas, which if you're familiar with verbena, they have that nice little rounded flower. This is almost like you pulled it out on a spike. And these, um, the flowers kind of work their way down the spike. It's almost like shark's teeth. You'll see one set of flowers and by the end of the day, they're fading. And the next morning, another set has moved in and then another set. Um, but the butterflies and the hummingbirds go bonkers over porter weed. All these will top out kind of between, you know, two and a half to almost getting four feet tall, some of the bigger ones. Um, and kind of all ranging in those, you know, lighter hues, you nectar wand red. Uh, this photo really doesn't give it justice as it's a bit more red than that, that color that you're seeing on the photo. Um, Durham's blue eyes is a really cool one that we got from a uh, nursery down in Louisiana. But these are fantastic. I mean, they're not going to overwhelm you with flowers, but it's kind of like because they're luring all these butterflies in, it, it's almost like you get accessories with this one. Um, but I, I do, I love porter weeds. They're just easy to blend into things and they're great. You know, the pollinators love them. Yeah, here it's an annual. Um, I, you know, part of me would be tempted to leave a couple on the ground to find out. I mean, some, you know, we found out. Yeah, well, you're in a different zone now. You will find out. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we found out last year, we sold that fuchsia. If any of you got that fuchsia, check out if you left it in the ground. We've got a couple coming back already. Um, so, you know, there's a couple fuchsias that actually are hardy. So we're really excited to see how, you know, that's the fun sometimes in leaving things in the ground of what comes back the next year. Um, but uh, these are easy to easy to garden with. Um, this is one, uh, Tratoscantia. Basically, there's a whole movement in kind of the botanical garden world to look at common names. And if there's, you know, names that we really don't want to use anymore. Um, so now Triascantia is basically going by inch plant. This one, Scylla Montana gold stripes. Um, we were at, Scylla Montana has actually been hardy for us. It gets kind of, kind of like lamb's ears, got those silvery, hairy leaves. Um, but this variegated one showed up just recently and we were at a plant auction and one quart plant went for $300 in that auction. Um, and then the next year I was in a garden center and saw one for $9. So I quickly snagged it up. Um, but it's a, it's a great little, you know, filler plant. And then, you know, and this one is coming back for us this year. So, you know, it's one of those things that maybe you pinch a couple pieces to tide you over through the winter, but leave it on the ground. It might, it should come back um, unless we have a horrible winter. Um, this one, Nanook, um, there's another name. It's got like five different names on it, but this is another one you're going to rely on the foliage color more than the flowers. Um, you know, the flowers are tiny, so they're going to kind of disappear in things. Um, but both of these are easy, easy to grow, easy to propagate if you want more. Um, but uh, again, these are mostly about foliage. Um, moving into perennials, this is one that we added into the pink and white garden last year, and now we're adding more. Um, agapanthus is something that you think about, you know, going out to California and seeing the beautiful agapanthus in the gardens there. They've been doing a lot of breeding, and this, this galaxy, there's galaxy white, which we have this year, but and galaxy blue, they were bred in Michigan. Um, there are species of agapanthus that are more cold hardy. Um, so I think we're going to start seeing more. I keep seeing, I, I follow a couple breeders and there's some insane colors coming down the, uh, pathway. I think they finally cracked the code on getting a pink agapanthus. Um, so maybe one day we'll see that, 
But this one, Galaxy White, did really well for us in the pink and white garden last year. So again, we're adding more into that garden, but these will start in July. Um, it's kind of fun. I would almost try to save some of the spent flower heads. You could spray paint them and do some fun things with kind of dried arrangements with it. Um, but they're, they are tough perennials. Um, then speaking of tough, um, alliums, these are things that are pretty much critter proof. Anything in the allium family, you know, they've got that kind of garlicky smell. Um, a good rule of thumb is plants that have kind of um, foliage with odor to it. Critters don't like anything in the salvia family, the mint family. It's just like, no, we don't want to deal with that. Um, and onions, the ornamental onions are, you know, definitely in that group. These will come into bloom kind of mid, mid to late summer. Um, and there's been more and more coming out on the market. Um, we've got some of the bulb types that'll come into flower in between the tea houses. They're already sending up their, uh, their um, flower spikes. They're just starting. This one kind of has more of a pale purple to it. Um, again, all the, all the ornamental onions, these are fantastic if you do dried arrangements to you know save them dry them uh, my wife has done you know on some of these species she spray painted them red white and blue and they did a kind of a fourth of july um, decoration but these they're great perennials um, and tough as nails um, if you're looking for a great butterfly weed this is a, a yellow flowered selection of our native um, and it is it's fantastic it's a bright yellow these will flower pretty much through the midsummer um, you can usually get about three months of flower out of them. Um, one thing that I will say is when you plant this, make sure that's where you want to keep it. They, it does not like being disturbed. Um, you dig these and it's going to, it'll, it'll at minimum set them back a number of years, but they're, once they get established, they require very little. Um, they can tolerate some pretty harsh conditions. Um, but this is Hello Yellow. So, and it's one of those ones that even if you go in the Blue Ridge, you can see color variants. You'll see some yellow ones popping up. So someone just picked a yellow one and, and named that. Um, Baptisia, we keep adding new ones every year because they keep breeding new ones. Um, this one, Lunar Eclipse, there's another one out there that's kind of similar to this, but I'm, I really like this bicolor effect they're starting to get, to get on these Baptisias. So this one has kind of, I, I don't know if it's the flower's age to the blue. Um, kind of reminds me of an old tropical called Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow. But I love this bicolor effect on this one. And then Grape Escape is um, some of these more kind of reddish purple tones that they're bringing into Baptisia. Um, Baptisia, again, are another one of those perennials that when you plant it, make sure that's where you want it um, because they are they're tough because you know, the roots will almost get woody. We cleaned out the Baptisia collection at the Ralston years ago when I was there. I thought I was hitting tree roots. Um, it was Baptisia. I had a perennial kick my rear end on trying to dig these things out because they were so rooted in. And that's why they, you know, once they're established, they're, they're pretty much maintenance free. Um, they just do their thing. Um, Dianthus, this is something that I always tell people, uh, you know, there's such an impulse by you smell that perfume, you plant it out and 90% of them will die because most of them do not like the heat and the humidity in our heavy soils in the South. So, you know, when some kind of rise to the top that have been persistent in the South, there's, you know, Bath's Pink, which is an old one. Um, there's Fire Witch. Um, and then there was this breeding of, out of, of all things England, the Wetman series, um, Wetman's bred tons of, of Dianthus. I worked for a company that actually represented them. And it turned out their star series of Dianthus actually did really well in the South. So this one, um, you know, kind of that beautiful bluish gray foliage on it that, you know, when it's not in flower, it's a little tight mound, only about seven inches tall. It'll get about, you know, um, about a foot tall with just fluorescent pink flowers and really nice fragrance to it. Um, but this is actually one of the dianthus that will do well in the south. Um, and, you know, believe me, I've fallen for it too. I go in and I see a pretty one and I try it and mourn it as it suffers along. You know, you, you finally have to kind of do a mercy killing on some of those things. Um, again, and this is another group that I, I'm kind of always torn because do we really need this many cone flowers? And then I buy them. Um, 
but I will say this one, Pretty Parasols, I've been looking at because I love the color on this. All three of these varieties are some of the taller ones. They're about 30 inches tall. Um, Pretty Parasols is one that Tony Avent's been growing in Raleigh, and he said has been a, a really good performer for him. Um, there's this Meadow Mama series that's come out that I think has done well. Um, you know, unfortunately, the, the trial reports are from Philadelphia that I was reading on these, but they did pretty well. Um, so, you know, just a lot of different color breaks, but this pretty parasol, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, you know, say that one of those suckers is reserved for me because I've been, I've been watching that one. Um, but just a really nice color on that one. Um, it jumps out at me. But echinaceas, again, you know, you're going to want these for summer. Um, if you leave the seed heads on, they will seed around. It's not necessarily going to come back exactly what you like, but you know, the birds do like the seeds. So this is one that I'm, I'm more inclined to let the seed heads, you know, go. And if you're really particular about keeping the integrity, you know, you'd want to cut the seed heads off or scatter the seeds somewhere else. But um, again, this is a great, you know, the goldfinches love the seeds on echinaceas. Um, this is one that, you know, every time I see the word deer and rabbit resistant, I'm kind of like, yeah, right. Uh, we have had this in our garden, and believe me, the deer have been horrible this year. Um, they really didn't mess with it last year. Um, I'm not. I'm never going to say something is 100% deer resistant because they will eat anything. But this has been an extremely long flowering, um, you know, helianthus for us, and just the, that color contrast with that kind of yellowish eye or that orange eye with the yellow uh, ring, um, it really stands out. So. You know, the Heliopsis I do love, they're, they're tough, um, you know, not necessarily a finicky perennial, because of course with any plant, you're gonna have to get them in that establishment period. You do have to baby them right when you plant them, but this is one that once it settles in, it's tough. Um, hostas, again, man, there are a lot of them out there. And, you know, um, we try to have a different smattering of them every year. Um, both dancing with dancing with dragons and high society. These these are smaller type pastas. They're only going to be you know about 15, 18, 18 inches tall. Um, this new one, drop dead gorgeous, is about a thirty inch tall hosta. So it's a bigger hosta. Um, but dancing with dragons, one of the things they claim is that this one holds its blue color much much longer than most of the ones. Usually with blue hostas in the south, we start getting hot, and that blue color comes from a waxy coating on the leaves. And what happens when you heat wax, it melts. So, you know, that's why a lot of your blue hostas will go green during the summer. Um, but all these are really, really good. High society is a sport off of June, which is a great hosta. And usually, you know, you, typically you start out with good parents and you get good, good children, uh, typically. Um, but this, these are two different flocks that we've got. And again, this is one of those things where I love it when you get variegated leaves because it just adds more to the plant. Um, Phlox de Vericata is a fantastic native um, perennial. You know, typically when it's not flowering, it's only about six inches tall. Um, this one is a sport that came out of Plant Delights Nursery. And I remember when Tony Avon showed it to us. He, I mean, Tony, Tony is, you know, an amazing plantsman, but, you know, he was like, this is one of the best ones we've ever introduced. And I think I just saw crediting that Plant Delights has introduced at least over a thousand plants to the industry. But this is a variegated form of Phlox de Vericata or woodland phlox. Um, it's got, you know, it, it's almost just icing on the cake when it comes into flower with those purple flowers. Um, and those, you know, if you plant a couple of those out, they will seed around. They're not going to seed around and be variegated. But, um, you know, a couple of the variegated ones will really add a pop of color into the shade garden. Um, then this Phlox uh, triple play, this is a much taller Phlox. It'll be about a about a foot tall in terms of just in foliage and then it'll get about two feet tall when it comes into flower it's got a little bit more of a pinker flower uh, flowers a little later than uh, the woodland phlox which is what's in bloom right now um, so both of these are you know again adding a little bit more dimension into the plant than just flowers um, this is one that uh, I love it when people always say that oh you know cultivars are bad you know it, it's it's nonsense. Anyone that tells you that, you know, gives you a binary of good or bad, nature does not work that way. This was a phlox that someone was walking along one of the rivers in Tennessee, saw something very different. Um, they got cuttings on it. 
Uh, this flox ended up going into the trials at Mount Cuba, which Mount Cuba does some amazing research work on, their focus is primarily on native plants. This cultivar attracted pollinators 10 to one over the straight species. Um, and it's just, it's funny because when you think about your tall garden flocks, you know, you've got bigger flowers. This one has lots of smaller size flowers. So it's almost can handle more pollinators being on it. And every time I've seen it, it's a fantastic looking tall flock. So this is one that'll, you know, it can get to about four feet tall. I've seen it paired with um, autumn minaret daylily, which is one of the taller daylilies of the gorgeous combination. Um, it's got really good um, mildew resistant. And, you know, it is the 2024 Perennial Plant Association plant of the year. Um, so this is one that I told Hayden a year ago, get a lot of these in. A, I want some in the garden, but this, it's just a fantastic plant. Um, you know, because usually tall flocks, one of the worst things that can happen to them is that mildew and they look horrible. This one with the mildew resistance, it's a great pollinator plant. It's a native plant. It's, it's checked so many boxes for people these days. Um, so definitely, definitely one I want in my garden. Um, this is a fun plant that it's, Phygelus, I first saw this when I worked for a plant introduction company years ago that was based in California. And I'd never seen these before. And then I just got kind of enamored. Some of them have been hardy for us. You kind of need to make sure they're in a well-drained area, you know, so they're not wet during winter. But this one that came out of Terra, Terra Nova Nurseries out in Oregon, their breeding program, um, I saw the pictures. I was like, oh, we got to, even if this is an annual for us, it's fantastic looking. Um, I think they've got kind of a, a, a lime yellow one that's, that Monrovia is getting ready to carry. But um, the picture up on the, on the top is in our greenhouse. And I can just see the, the hummingbirds going crazy for this. And it's supposed to flower all throughout the summer. So um, this is one that, you know, you may want to keep in a pot, bring it inside, stick it in your garage for the winter. But like I said, we had a couple planted out um, that we left around the lion's head fountain. They, they were evergreen throughout the whole winter. So again, just make a lot of things, a lot of times the, the thing that kills your plants is not temperature, it's wet feet during winter is what kills most plants. Um, so that's why, you know, always invest money in your soil, work on that soil, get well-drained soils and things will surprise you. But this one will top out um, what they're saying is pretty much at foliage height. You know, I was kind of joking that those aren't, you know, playmate of the year dimensions there. Um, it's basically the plant, you know, the flowers and then the, then the true height of the flowers. So, you know, you're looking about three feet tall for this plant. Um, but I'm, this is one that I want because I, I just, that color looks fantastic. Um, this is a native perennial that, I remember first seeing when I worked at Plant Delights Nursery and I just got enamored with it. And, you know, basically it was just the straight species that a lot of people were growing. And then they started doing like Tony, Tony Avon always did, he, you know, always joked and said he always, you know, did all these explorations to exotic areas like China and Taiwan and Alabama. Um, so one he selected was this one called Raging Cajun on the right that he found, you know, growing down in Louisiana. Um, Little Redhead was one of the first cultivars or clonal selections of this that just had a right, really nice growth habit, um, which was you know fantastic when that first came out. But then Tony found this Rage and Cajun, which he's got a great photo I stole from the website of the color comparison between the two, where Rage and Cajun is more of an orange red, while Little Redhead is, is more of a red red. Um, and Rage and Cajun is supposed to have more flowers, but these are fantastic. You get them planted out. You know, when I first saw it, it was more in part shade, you know, and it was a neat perennial. But once you move it out into the sun, it gets more dense, more flowers, and it just flowers for an extremely long period of time. Um, so, you know, while we have these for the sale too, I've got at least two flats that we're going to be planting out on the ground because this will be a fantastic, um, you know, plant for the wildlife. Um, but both of these, they're fantastic perennials. Indian pink is the uh, common name for these. Um, and this is a plant that I, I remember the first time I saw bird's foot violet. I just, it's, it's such a delicate looking violet. I mean, and you normally wouldn't think, when you think violets, you don't think necessarily, or, you know, are perennial violets. You're normally thinking of that thing that's in your lawn that you might try to get rid of. 
Um, no, I didn't say, but this one, it's called bird's foot violet because the leaves are finely dissected. So it looks like a bird's foot, but it's got these, these beautiful bicolor flowers and, you know, gradually the clump will get bigger and bigger. This one likes to be out in full sun, kind of well-drained, kind of drier side of the soils. Um, but this is something you normally don't see offered. Um, if you're looking for a really cool native plant, this is this is one that, you know, like I said, I wanted a bunch of, and usually that's kind of sometimes drives our plant selection. I'm going, I want that. Um, you know, lay all my cards on the table. But um, this is one that, that again, you're not going to find very often. Uh, thankfully, Walters had, had this available. So I, I pushed Hayden. I was like, please get that in here. Um, but this is a really cute one to put in, into some sunny areas. Um, don't plant it with things that are, are going to overtake it because it is a little more, it's a bit more delicate looking. Um, but once it's established, it's pretty tough. Okay, so moving into some different vines. Um, you know, one of our native, the trumpet, uh, trumpet vine, uh, trumpet creeper is another name. Typically, you see it more that reddish orange color. Um, this is one that was selected because it's almost a pure yellow. There's another clone called Flava that's out there, but this is, you know, it is a vigorous vine, so don't, you know, careful where you plant it because it will, it will grow very vigorously. Um, it's good to hack it back every year a little bit to keep it inbound, but this one is just a really nice color break from your typical trumpet vine. Um, one that I, I know uh, my dad always, you know, is, is Ronaldo going to have moon vine this year? Um, but this is one, if you've got kids or grandkids, that it's so fun to bring them out in the evening because when the flowers start coming out, they look like they look like soft serve vanilla ice cream cones. Um, and if you're patient enough, and this is one of those things of teaching kids about being patient, of you can watch the flowers unfurl and open. And then if you wait even longer, you know, when they fully open, the fragrance is amazing, but if you're really, you know, patient, you can watch and the, these hawk moths that have these, you know, proboscis that are about a foot long, just go crazy. Um, my wife had a whole wall of this planted at Senior one year, and we just stood there mesmerized as hundreds of these moths were going back and forth on it. It just, it was one of the coolest thing. We saw a family come in with their kids, and those kids just like squealed with delight watching this. Um, but you know, moon vine, it's just, it's, it's one of those things that it's an, it's an easy common annual, but man, you can't beat it for, you know, the evening. And it's one of those things we need to sometimes think about what time flowers are open for us because, you know, most people are at work, you know, from nine to five. So isn't it nice to come home and have something flowering when you're actually home? Um, but this is, you know, again, it's an easy, easy, uh, annual um, this is one that caused a stir. This is a, if you're, if you're a Red Sox fan, you know, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, I'm a Yankees fan, sorry. Um, but this actually, you know, the green monster at Fenway Park in 1988, Peter Del Tredici, who was at the Arnold Arboretum, saw a gold sport on the ivy on the green monster, and they got it propagated, and that's how we got this gold, gold leaf form of Boston ivy. Um, which, you know, ironically is not from Boston. It's actually an Asian species. But you can get this brilliant yellow color on the leaves all summer. And then when you go into fall, it'll start taking red tones onto it. So it gets fantastic red fall color. Um, again, Parthenocystis actually gets, you know, kind of suction cup tendrils. So, you know, it, it's, it will adhere to anything as it's going up. So just be mindful where you cite it that, you know, if you don't want to have that going on your house, don't cite it next to your, you know, house. Um, I've seen this, you know, adhering on a tree where they kept it pruned and it was fantastic. I mean, the color is just fantastic. Um, moving on to some shrubs, we had uh, some things left over from the fall plant sale and they're, they're too good not to put them back into the sale. Bottle brush buckeye. Um, this is one of those plants that it is never going to look good in a garden center. It is, I always describe it, it's a teenager. It is gangly in its youth. Um, basically, you'll see it in a three-gallon pot with two twigs. And it's one of those things of you got to have faith. Um, but in terms of a fantastic native shrub, um, this one gets yellow fall color. It gets these spikes of white you know, flowers that 
we had one at our old house and our neighbor kept calling it butterfly bush because we went out there and we had to stop at 50 at the number of swallowtails that were on it. Um, and it'll gradually creep, it'll send up suckers, so it will spread. You can put it in full sun going into, you know, kind of part shade, um, but it's just, it's a fantastic one. And so this is just the straight species bottle brush buckeye. Um, and you can collect the seeds and plant them out. Um, you know, again, it takes a while to get some substance to it, but this is a variety of it that actually blooms later. So what I always recommend is get both. You can extend that blooming season. So here you can see um, on the right-hand side of the photo is just the straight species. That's already done flowering. Then this one comes into flower. So it's a nice, you know, same kind of habit, uh, but it'll flower about two to three weeks later. Um, again, sun or shade, slightly rhizomatous. It's not one of those things that's just going to run over everything. Um, it slowly creeps and becomes bigger. Um, but if you go to like Longwood Gardens has an amazing planting of this, um, Chanticleer does. And when you catch a massive planting of this in flower, it's jaw dropping. But it's one of those things that again, it just, for some reason, it doesn't, it doesn't retail well because it looks like two sticks in a pot. Um, you know, it's, uh, you got to trust us on this. Um, Calicanthus, so, you know, many, we have the straight species in the plant sale. Um, and this is one of those things where, you know, if, if you're growing Calicanthus and you want the fragrance, um, you're going to, you know, you basically, if you're buying the straight species, some of them have fragrance, some of them don't, but Athens is probably hands down the most fragrant selection of Calicanthus. Um, you know, all these, the, they get, you know, all spice, you crush the leaves, it's kind of a menthol-y scent to it. Deer, again, they're, that's low on their preference list of anything that has that fragrance. It's a slowly suckering shrub. Um, this one, instead of being that kind of maroon, you know, colored flower, um, this one is a lime green, but hands down the best fragrance on any calicanthus. Um, I am trying to get cuttings. Uh, Wyatt Lefevre is a gardener over in uh, Kernersville. He found a population of yellow flowered calicanthus on one of the little islands in Lake Norman. Um, and the flowers are twice as big in the same color. So I want to get color cuttings of this. And a, a friend of ours, uh, since it was Wyatt Lefevre's uh, selection, he named it Yellow Lefevre. Um, but definitely want to get that one. But uh, until that's more available, Athens is one of those ones. If you if you want the fragrance on Caliganthus, that's that one and Michael Lindsay are the two best um, fragrant ones. We've got um, one that came from Proven Winners planted out on the property called Sensational. We'll see you know if it lives up to the marketing hype right now. But um, this is a fantastic, absolutely fantastic native shrub. They can top out. I've seen them, you know, I've seen Athens kind of topping out around five to six feet tall. And again, it's suckers, so it, it will, you know, get a little bit more girth and age. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they have, it's, it's, a, it's definitely a fruity scent. It's one of those things of trying to, trying to describe scent is not the easiest thing. Yeah. Well, and they've done a lot of, Tom Rainey up in Fletcher has done a lot of breeding with Calicanthus, of breed, you know, using the Western species, using the Asian species, and has gotten like Hartledge wine is just, I mean, that thing's a beast of a shrub. Um, but this is the just the straight native species to the Southeast. Um, so Bluebeard, um, this is, we actually brought this in, Tony, you know, there's been a couple gold foliage uh, varieties of Caryopteris. This is a kind of a shrubby perennial. Um, you know, it doesn't die to the ground. It's it's a woody plant almost. Um, it's kind of like, you know, where, where do perennials stop and shrubs start? Well, this is somewhere right in the middle. Um, these can get about three feet tall by about five feet wide, but they'll, what's, what's fantastic and what I liked about this was um, you know, in the blue and yellow garden, when we looked at the historic plans, they had caryopteris in there for the blue flowers. Well, here we can have both blue and yellow on the same plant, perfect for the blue and yellow garden. So we added a couple of these in here, but um, I pay attention to what Tony says because he he's pretty uh, ruthless in his opinions. <laughs> um, but he said, this is one that has done really well. There are some out there, like one of the first gold foliage ones was one, one called Worcester Gold. 
um, that's worse. Um, it kind of fades out to a kind of a sickly chartreuse, but this one stays a bright gold um, and then flowers in the middle, kind of like late summer for it. Um, again, um, it's got fragrance to the foliage. So again, a little more critter resistant, um, but does not like wet soils. So um, we had a number of these in the fall plant sale. And like I said, we, you know, they're, they're too good to get rid of. So we brought them back for uh, spring. Now this is a plant, I fell in love with this genus, um, the winter hazels, Coralopsis. You know, I always love trying to push our season, you know, let's, let's have spring a little earlier. Um, and these will typically, they'll get chains of kind of sulfur yellow flowers. Um, we've got one planted out by the gate that, you know, what's fantastic is when nothing else is in flower, this is coming into flower. So you get these chain, pendant chains of sulfur yellow flowers. And then this is an amazing selection that was found as a seedling in Japan with this brilliant gold foliage. Um, the photo you see of the, of the full shrub was taken in a garden up in uh, Asheville in I think August or September. Um, but this whole genus, uh, the, the leaves almost look pleated. They've got these wonderful, this just wonderful texture. So even if it wasn't gold leaf on it, it's a, it's a fantastic in terms of foliage, but then you throw in this gold color and it will really brighten up a shadier corner of your garden. You know, you don't want to put it out in full afternoon sun. That's going to be, you know, pretty rough on it. So if you can get morning sun on it, you're going to get just this brilliant golden backdrop throughout the whole season. Um, again, you know, it's one of those plants that I want. So that's why it's in the plant sale. Um, this is perhaps one of my favorite hydrangeas out there. Um, this is one called Fuji Waterfall. Um, it's hard to call it a lace cap because, you know, normally when you think about lace cap, you've got those sterile florets just as a little halo. Well, this one, it just kind of keeps filling in on itself. It almost becomes a mop head, but it's got these double, double white flowers. The foliage is like glossy dark green. I've never seen mildew on it. It tends to reflower later on in the season. It's just, it's one of the hands down one of the best hydrangeas out there that's not sitting in there in a baby blue marketed pot. Um, you know, it's an old variety, but it, it just does fantastic. And this is one that, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that we had it here because it just, it's, it, because it's not in a branded pot and exclusive to, you know, whatever nursery, um, it doesn't get carried, but it, it's a great plant. Um, it's just, you know, you can't have exclusivity on it, so we don't want it, but, you know, Hmm. I've seen Fuji waterfall. I've seen older plants that'll top out at about three feet tall by about three feet wide. Um, but it, it is, like I said, it, it's one of the hydrangeas that I would not garden without. Is that good English? I wouldn't put it in full blazing sun. Um, Dr. Durr really made fun of Todd and I when we had hydrangeas out in the sun. He came, so we, we saw him coming one day. We ran out and put umbrellas over our hydrangeas. <laughs> It would, yeah. I mean, morning sun would be good, and and it's it's like a lot of things. If you if you're going to push them out into more sun, try to give them a little more more water. Um, yeah, it's it, it is. Um, now this is a fun one if you like figs, but you really don't have the space. Um, Lloyd Traven at uh, Peace Tree Farms up there in Pennsylvania, they are 100% organic. And he is, he, is, he is, again, one that he will not hide his opinion from you. If you say, oh, you can't do organic as a big nursery, he, I won't say the choice words he'll tell you. Uh, but he, he's an amazing plantsman. I remember talking to him at a show, and, he goes, and this stood out to me. He goes, we as an industry do our best jobs to absolutely bore the daylights out of our customers he was talking about you know growing the same thing so they always have more cutting edge stuff well this actually came out of uh, peace tree farms it's a dwarf fig that's supposed to keep flowering keep producing fruit pretty much stay kind of that two and a half foot tall um size so you know we're trying it for the first time knowing lloyd it's you know when you know who it comes from you can kind of listen to the you know you can trust the marketing a little bit more, but um, I'm looking forward to seeing how this does. Um, he's also the force behind, if you've grown phenomenal lavender, 
that was a Peace Tree Farms introduction. And then Sensational is another one that's out there. But, you know, they're a great nursery with a great reputation. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, you could have a little dwarf fig on your patio. This one, what I would re I would recommend maybe like slot, if you have it in a container, stick it in your garage for the winter. Um, we've got a couple. Yeah, there's a, yeah. It... Yeah. Well, even, and, and sometimes it's, it's also citing if, you know, I would almost recommend this and it would be great in a container because, you know, if we get a polar plunge of five degrees coming, pick it up, stick it in the, in the, yeah. Um, but, you know, this is one where I will probably stick one of these. Don't tell Michelle, but I'm going to encourage her to put one in the herb garden. Uh, oh, well, well, we can. It, they're, they're very, figs are very unique in how the blooms are. The blooms are encased inside. So when you look at that fruit, it's basically an aggregate of a bunch of different flowers on the inside that, you know, usually when you're eating a fig, you're not eating this, but a wasp will go in there, kind of get trapped and pollinate everything. And then I think it basically gets digested. Um, you're not eating wasps. You know, that's the crunchy part of the Fig Newton. Sorry. Um, but yeah, this is one that, you know, while we haven't grown it yet, knowing where it came from, I think, uh, you know, this is definitely worth a try. Um, this is something exciting. You know, Proven Winners and um, Spring Meadow keeps offering all these, you know, um, all these different elderberries with the purple foliage and they're all the european elderberry that absolutely just dies a slow painful death in the south um this plantsman keith mearns down uh, in south carolina he and i are talking about trading some different uh, lilacs but he found a gold leaf form of our native elderberry um, and the photo that you're seeing in the bottom left that was at plant delights in full blazing hot sun in the middle of summer. Um, it is absolutely a beacon in terms of brilliant gold foliage on a, on a native. And I, I unfortunately, you know, we hit ours for cutting so we could have plants here. So I didn't get to see it, but it'll get those little white flowers then followed by the, that black fruit, which I can't wait to see that contrast on that foliage. Um, but, you know, this is one of those things like if, if you're like me who just got so frustrated with all these really cool color leaf elderberries that you know would come out and you buy them and they just die. Um, this is our native, so it, it is tough, it's vigorous, it's gonna be happy down here. Um, this one, I mean, you can put it in average garden soils, it'll be fine. Um, again, you know, with that caveat of get it established. Yeah, yeah. But this one, I mean, seeing, you know, seeing it out in the blazing hot sun and it was that bright, I was like, oh my God. Um, so when the Ralston had some of these in one of their plant sales, I made sure to scoop it up and then we tried cuttings and I was like, yeah, it roots. Um, so this is one that I'm excited to, to offer. Um, this is another one of my little weird plants that I really want people to kind of look at because um, Anything, like I said, that has that early spring flowering before, you know, azaleas and, and the big push. Um, Stachyurus, uh, they're called spike tails because they'll get these little racemes. And it almost like makes me think about the 70s bead curtains, you know, the way that they hang down. Um, but, you know, it's not, it's, a, it's kind of a, a pale sulfur yellow in terms of the, um, the color. So it's not like the brightest thing, but I've seen some of these plants that are, are massive and they're absolutely stunning. This is one that is primarily evergreen. Um, it's called the willow leaf spike tail because it's, the foliage is almost that airy texture to it. Um, and it's still, it's, um, we found a nursery out on, the, out on the West Coast and this gentleman was the propagator for Schmidt, but he has his own little micro nursery and he's growing some really cool stuff. And, you know, when I was looking at the plant list, they had this on there. I'm like, this would be a fun one to bring in. Um, we'll get some planted out here. Um, definitely one is going in my yard, but they're, they're a really good plant. 
um, in terms of early spring flowering. There's some variegated ones. Adrian has a really cool variegated one called Magpie planted over at Cener that we're gonna uh, get more cuttings on. So they're, most of them drop their leaves, but this one holds on to its leaves all throughout the year. Um, but this is a fun, you know, early, early spring flowering shrub. Um, now this is a weeping lilac um, called hers. Um, these are photos actually taken from Cener over in uh, Kernersville. And it does, it kind of has this arching habit. It's not a lilac like when you think of up, new, new, up in New York with the big, you know, solid trusses. It's kind of like more of the lilacs that, that do well here with the smaller flowers, but it's still fragrant. I love this arching habit. I think it'd be a fun one to, to play around with pruning wise. So it's not just a haystack that you could actually kind of artistically prune it. So it actually has almost like a, a Japanese maple shape in your garden. Um, but this one, again, it's a lilac that does well for us in the South. It's got this wonderful weeping habit, um, kind of that pinkish, uh, light pink flowers. Um, but this one, again, you know, now that we kind of feel confident in, in being able to propagate lilacs, I'm going to start trying to bring more lilacs into our plant sales and actually trying to focus on more that look like your traditional lilac. So if anyone's a transplant from the North, maybe we can bring back a, a little bit of um, yeah. Yes, it's got really good fragrance to it. Yep. Um, she's got this. It's it's getting almost full. I mean, it's uh, it's backed by a brick wall, and it's getting a, almost full day sun. Um, you know, it'd probably be a little bit more open if it was in in a bit more shade, but um, I would I think you could push it to about part sun. Um, and that, and this one, I God, I can't, I don't know how many years it's been in the ground, but it's it's standing at about eight feet tall. But they're easy to prune; they respond well to pruning. But this one, I think, like I said, have a little more fun with you know the architecture of it. Um, yeah, um, tree wise. So this is a hybrid of two of our different buckeyes. The um, Aeschylus pavia, which is our native red buckeye, and then the horse chestnut. So it's a hybrid between the two. So it's going to be, you know, kind of a medium sized tree with kind of a reddish pink flowers on it in spring. Um, again, perfect, you know, for when the hummingbirds start coming through. But this was one of the, I remember first seeing this uh, working in the garden at Plant Delights, and I just fell in love with this one because it, it just is so unique in terms of the flower color. Um, it's not something we normally see early spring on trees. Um, so we've got a handful of these in the plant sale. Um, this is the Asian um, fringe tree. So we have our, our native Cyananthus. Um, Cyananthus retusus is tough as nails. Stephen Creech down at uh, Stephen F. Austin planted these for a mile down in Nacogdoches, Texas. And it I like trees that even at the end of the summer, the, the leaves are still as dark, glossy green as they were in spring. Some trees, you look at them and it's kind of like, oh God, is summer over? Can I please drop these things? Um, but this one, really nice foliage, but it has this wonderful, more upright habit. Um, they've got about four of these planted over at Cener. That's where these photos are from. But it's, it's not really tight columnar, but it's more upright growing. Um, just brilliant, clear white flowers. Um, and it does have a fragrance to it. Um, kind of gets, with age, it gets a little bit more exfoliating bark. Uh, it does get yellow fall color. It's just, it's a great tree, um, hands down. Um, let's see. This is a native tree. We had a bunch of these in the fall plant sale, and, and they're small, so they're, you know, it's not something that's going to bowl you over, but we had one of these in our, at our old house. This is our, one of our native dogwoods. Um, if you go up on the Blue Ridge Parkway, if you know where Graveyard Fields is, um, right in that parking lot, if you go a little further down, they're growing right on the edge of the road there. Um, it gets, ours are budding up with flowers now. Instead of being like our, our native dog, you know, our flowering dog, which has, which has the big white bracts, this has tons of little white flowers. Pollinators go crazy for it. But then it gets in the fall, this, these almost blue black berries on red racemes and they just stand out gets really nice fall color but they, sometimes they call it wedding cake tree because if you look at that tree it gets this layered habit as it goes up 
Um, it's, it's a fantastic underutilized native tree. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. They'll go for it. Um, and you know, like I said, I, I don't know. This is something again, it probably because it doesn't look well in a pot in a garden center. That's why it's not going to be popular. Um, and unfortunately there's too many really good plants that just, you know, you got to get them in the ground and get them going. Um, but ours are probably standing, you know, the ones that we're selling, they're probably about four feet tall. They've already got flower buds coming, but this is a great native tree to have. Um, um, yet another one, anything in the Styrax family, I'm a junkie for. Um, you know, we've got native Styrax, there's Asian Styrax, then there's Halesia, which is the Florida silver bell. Um, really nice yellow fall color. Um, this is a selection that tends to have bigger flowers. It really stands out. I really want to get a, there's a selection down at a garden in Georgia that's that's unreal, but any of these will look fantastic. They kind of get a little bit exfoliating bark as they get aged, but in terms of a woodland spring flowering tree, Halesia are just fantastic to have in the garden. Um, and, you know, kind of dogwood size, you know, 20 to 30 feet tall is maturity, so it's not going to be a big tree. Now, this is one that I remember um, originally there was just this rumor that there was a different species of parodia. Parodia is a tough, parodia persica comes from kind of like Afghanistan, really tough environments. Um, they get amazing exfoliating bark. They get amazing fall color. But then there was this like, you know, this is back like early 90s that there was some, some disc discussion about Oh, there's there's a Chinese species of it, and I mean the the effort to try to get it into this country, um, and it ends up being it is unreal for fall color. Um, you know, it's a it's a smaller stature tree again, almost dogwood size, twenty to thirty feet tall. Um, the growth habit kind of is spreading, but then as it ages, it kind of gets more upright growing. Um, I stole these photos from my old boss, uh, my director at the Ralston Arboretum. He's up in Pennsylvania, and you know, usually we kind of nudge him about what he can't grow now that he moved back up north. But he goes on about this tree. So it starts out almost black purple in terms of fall color, and that photo is taken October 1st. The cherry red photo is November 22nd. So you're talking about two months of fall color in the garden. Um, and, you know, anyone that's growing this is just goes bonkers over the fall color for it. Um, so, you know, this is one that I, I was really excited. Again, this is the little nursery that we found in Oregon that had just really cool stuff on it. Um, but when he had Parodia, the subaqualis, the Chinese ironwood, I was like, we have to get that. Now the plants we have are small. They're only about, you know, two or three feet tall give it a couple years it's gonna it'll start getting a really nice growth rate um but they're tough as nails too so i mean if you want some really good fall color i'd love to see this i mean you know there's off, often the discussion about oh native plants are better adapted um depends on where you're putting it you know yeah we put red maples in the middle of a parking lot at walmart and just watch them suffer because that's not where they want to be something like ironwood the heat would be perfect. And I, I, can you imagine a parking lot filled with that fall color for two months? Um, you know, again, right plant for the right place. You know, that, that's, that's more important than where it actually came from. Um, so this is a plant that JC Ralston was, was so enamored with flowering apricots. Um, when he passed away, part of his will was leaving money to the city of Raleigh to plant flowering apricots over the city. They always come into flower before anything else does. Um, these are photos from the plant right outside the um, outside of the vegetable garden. This is uh, Omoin nomama, kind of a white to light pink flower, extremely good fragrance, flowers before anything else is in flower. Um, what's really nice is they'll, it'll do these long straight shoots. So if you wanted to cut those, bring them inside as cut flowers. Um, they're fantastic. It's just it's a shame that again, these are not easily available anymore. Um, so, you know, now that we're, we're feeling a little more confident about propagating these, I wanna start offering these because there are some that are cherry red with cinnamon scent that flower in December. Um, they're just, they're great small flowering trees. And I've, I've always, like when I was at High Point University, we built a collection 
I think we had 20 different types of Japanese flowering apricot. And so they came into flower in January. So, you know, I always love like, let's, let's, let's limit the amount of doldrums in terms of uh, winter. Um, but this is one, again, I, I, I'm, I'm a junkie for these too. I want everyone that's out there. Um, there's one called bridal, bridal wreath. That's a weeping white flowered one that um, hopefully once we get our, you know, ours going enough, we can get some cuttings off of that. Um, but fantastic small flowering fragrant tree for early, early spring, late winter flower. So that's just a taste. We have about 180 different plants in the plant sale. Um, so, you know, if there isn't something for you, let's talk. We need to, you know, um, we re it really is a good smattering of a lot of different things. Um, it's really my goal to make sure that we've got things that you're not going to find anywhere else that hopefully that we've tried that we, you know, we've had success with. Um, some things always are a supply surprise where, oh, this looks cool. Let's all find out together. Um, but, you know, like I said, it, it could be drugs. Um, but, you know, just running through just how it's going to work. If you're a friend of Renolda Gardens, um, ideally, we're going to be sending out that pre-order in the next hour or so. So you'll get that email. Um, you know, if you don't get it, please reach out. Um, those pre-orders will take those orders up through about 8 p.m. On, when on Wednesday, April 17th. Um, you know, we'll basically get everything tallied, you know, give me a little time because believe me, those orders, the fish, especially at the beginning, they start pouring in and it's, it's, it's a chore to get them tallied, but we'll get them out as quick as possible. Um, ideally, you know, you pick a time, whether it's morning, midday or afternoon to pick these up, pull up, you can shop more, um, you know, shop to your heart's content or as much as you can stuff in your car. Um, you know, again, we do have to add the taxes on there. So, you know, unfortunately that, you know, death and taxes are the two of the things we can always count on. Um, if you don't get that email, like I said, reach out, but you can always, even now go ahead and go online, become a friend. You'll still, the minute, the minute we get updated, um, friends, Sarah is really good about letting me know. And I get the form immediately emailed out to you. So you you basically have up until next sun, this coming Sunday um, to become a friend and get the pre-order. But, you know, I would move quickly on it because, like I said, some things will sell out quickly. Um, again, if aside from the pre-orders, we will see you on Saturday from 8 to 2 on the front lawn of Renolda House. John, there is no next Sunday. Saturday, April 20th. April 16th. Um, not this Saturday. Um, and there is no Sunday, April so Any 16th. questions from anyone? Yes. So, so one thing that was uh, very different this year is um, we've got a small construction project going on. Um, so we really had to pivot and quickly get a semi-temporary growing house going that, you know, overwintering, you know, place to hold all of our orchids, all the plants that we're saving to go back into the greenhouse. So we are, I mean, I think we can say we've got almost every square inch top and bottom underneath the benches hanging from the rafters of growing space that we can, but some things we just, you know, we didn't have the capacity to do. So I love that plant. So it will be back next year. But, and that's one that, you know, next year, if you have it in a pot, drag it into the, into the garage. Um, next time. Yep. There's always next year. We're all gardeners are optimists. Um, anyone else? Yes. Uh, we don't have PayPal um, because we have to, you know, go, abide by the university, you know, guidelines. So that kind of makes things sometimes challenging. Um, but we will do cash, check, or credit card. Um, and like I said, it's a new credit card system that, that she has said that you basically, we don't have tap. That would be really getting with the times, but you can just swipe. I, I don't think we're going to have to do, you know, what's your name, your address, your favorite Zodiac sign, you know, all the things that when we first started doing this, that were really tedious. It should be, credit cards should be a lot easier this year. 
Um, we still are doing cash and check, even though that was about 7% of what our total you know, payment methods were. Um, we'll still be doing um, cash and check for the sale too as well. Any other questions? I'm confused, online? John. Any questions online? Um, so, so the, um, the pre-sale order form will be mailed out, emailed out to friends probably within the next hour or so. So if you don't immediately see it in your, uh, mailbox, check your spam folder. If it still isn't there, email either myself or Sarah. Um, so it's just John at Renolda.org or Sarah at Renolda.org. We'll quickly check, make sure you get it. Um, you have up until, you know, ne this coming Sunday to become a friend, that gives us enough time to actually make sure, you know, that information gets to us through the system. Um, you can pre-order all the way up until Wednesday, next Wednesday, April 17th, up to 8 p.m. Because, you know, I'm getting older, I need to get in bed. Um, but then pre-orders will be picked up on Friday from 10 to 6 um, and then the big plant sale that's open to everyone is from eight to two on Saturday, April 20th. So hopefully we'll all see you out there and you'll be buying many more plants because I guarantee most of them will, they'll, they'll, they will perform better than the stock market. <laughs> thank y'all and thank y'all for your support. Any Anthony Parker salvia this year? I didn't see it on the list. No, okay. I don't think we've got a couple other salvias. We've got salvia, salvia lucantha. Yeah, I emailed the list out. So that that's that's the most updated list that we've got. Okay, so that's what's happening. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, 